on your grave and love Where's that girl you love She buried you in spring with her tears in her eyes and she sung When she left her Love 
loves you, she will cry in the long river that will Um, hey, good morning, everybody. Football team. Thank you so much for joining this uh, breakfast conversation. Thank you to Uber for hosting us. Thank you to the World Economic Forum. Um, we're going to talk. We're talking a lot here at Davos. I've been coming to Davos for many years. I'm Kamal Ahmed. I'm the editor in chief and co-founder of the News Movement, and I've been coming to Davos for many years. And we talk about climate and the climate crisis and what we need to do. Um, as organizations, as individuals, as businesses, as governments. And sometimes it doesn't appear very practical. What are we supposed to practically do? Well, what could be more practical than how you get around the city you live in, how you get home from work, how you get to work, how you get home from a night out, and how can that be connected to the challenge we all face around climate change? And the really practical part of that is electric vehicles. Of all the policy issues that have a practical today application, electric vehicles seems to me to be one of the clearest to the public and most obvious that we can really do some good work together. So Dara, Chief Executive of Uber, delighted to have you here on the stage uh, with us, with our fabulous guests who are experts uh, in this area. We're going to have a fantastic conversation for the next 45 minutes about the EV revolution. Now, if we've been having this conversation maybe just two years ago, it could have felt more positive. It could have felt there was real momentum. But the signals we're starting to hear are maybe slightly different. This notion of cost, this notion of accessibility, this notion of do we need to do this quite now? Are we going too quickly? Does it really matter as much as we thought? Cost of living crisis, surely that's more important. Surely the wars, the wars around the world are more important. Well, Dara, I'm going to come to you first because I know you know that is the challenge. And I just wondered if you could outline for us, just to kick us off here, Chief Executive of Uber, your approach to EVs, but also the challenge, which I think is what is so interesting about this debate, the challenge you want to lay down for policymakers and for businesses that can reboot and re-energize the EV electric vehicle conversation. Absolutely, and thank you for hosting the, the panel here. So I think from our standpoint, um, you know, Uber is the largest on-demand transportation platform on earth. Uh, transportation of people from point A to B and now increasingly food, groceries, et cetera. Uh, both for our own services and third parties. If you order an iPhone with Apple, we could get it uh, delivered to you same day. Um, that is a wonderful convenience, but that wonderful convenience comes at a cost to the environment today. Uh, transportation is one of the few industries in the world uh, where uh, our carbon footprint collectively is still increasing, not decreasing. We're getting more efficient. But the demand for transportation as world GDP increases and as uh, more countries uh, uh, improve GDP, et cetera, the demand for uh, transportation is constant and it's growing. So as the largest transportation platform on Earth, we do over 2 billion trips now per quarter. So there are a lot of trips happening, a lot of connections between point A and B. Uh, we have taken it upon ourselves uh, to really push to electrify our fleet. And we have a goal to electrify our fleet 
uh, by 2030 in the U.S., Europe, Canada, and by 2040 on a global basis. Uh, it's a big, ambitious, audacious goal, but um, that's kind of what Uber does. Uh, we are off to a strong start, uh, and there's a ton of excitement, as you said, early on around electrifying the fleet. Uh, we now have the largest EV fleet, if you want to call that, uh, in the world. Over 70,000 of our vehicles are now fully electric. Uh, in California, 10% of our uh, kilometers are uh, on, the, uh, on our service are electric. In places like London, for example, it's over 20%. Uh, so we are changing over our fleet to electric as, as we go. And we're creating the incentives for our drivers to make the switch from ICE vehicles to electric vehicles. But the incentives, the economic incentives have to be there, right? So like, it's when you're dealing with the scale that we're dealing with, it's not enough just to say it's the right thing to do for the world, even though it is the right thing to do for the world. We actually have to create economic flywheels to do so. So for example, uh, we have committed about $800 million of our own capital to help fund this switch over to electric. One small example is we take a, a smaller take rate for electric trips versus combustion trips that then helps those drivers fund what is right now a higher cost of acquisition for electric vehicles. We're working with the industry, for example, with Hertz, rental car basis, to make electric vehicles available uh, to our drivers. We are working with governments and cities to um, put charging infrastructure not just where uh, the wealthy live in the center of cities, but actually where our drivers, who usually don't live in the center of cities, really need it. And what's vital about our audience and our driver base is that the average Uber driver drives on average four times the number of kilometers of the average driver. Uh, so we think the unit of value that you should be looking at is not the number of electric vehicles that you're selling, but actually the electric miles or kilometers that you're enabling. And so every car and every driver is not built alike, so to speak, the Uber driver is much, more, much more valuable to the environment when that Uber driver uh, makes the change over to electric. So we are off to a good start. We have been off to a good start. Uh, but climate is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. Uh, and one of the significant reasons why we are here in Davos and why we wanted to have this panel is that it does feel to us like there's a bit of momentum shift. Uh, people are going from the front foot to kind of back foot on this. Uh, and we want to make sure that as you've gone from this unbelievably exciting idea to the hard work of execution. Hard, you know, execution is no fun. Right? The real world has a way of punching you in the face. <laughs> uh, and we are in that phase of the hardcore execution phase. And more and more, we need determination. We need partners. Uh, to complete you know, this uh, transfer over and electrifying our fleet, but then helping overall in, in, the, in the energy transition that absolutely has to happen. Thanks so much, Dara, for that um, overview. What do you think has led to... Actually, I want to do a little straw poll. Who uses Uber in here? <laughs> Thank you. Look at that. <laughs> Excellent work. There are Ubers uh, around uh, here. You need to get around, by the way. They're uh, Dara, you've talked about momentum shift. What do you put that down to? I mean, I, you know, cost of living, conflict, somehow not EV specifically, yeah. but the debate about the energy, energy transition does appear to have shifted in some way. What do you put it actually down to? You suggested execute the hard work yeah. is when it's easy to bail out, maybe. What do you think is going on here? Well, I, th I think that the product market fit is, is tough to achieve. In that the, what we're seeing is that while there's absolutely intent with uh, companies, governments, et cetera, to lean in, the consumer says one thing and then does something differently. You know, the consumer will say, of course I want to be on an electric vehicle, et cetera. And by, by the way, about 40% of, in the US, for example, 40% of our riders have taken a ride in one of our EVs and absolutely love it, mm. okay? So they love the product. 
they are not willing to pay a nickel more for that product. Uh, now, they will pay with their time. So if a regular UberX takes a four minute ETA, a certain sub-segment sub of our population will wait eight minutes, will wait eight minutes, will uh, wait 10 minutes, et cetera. But because the consumer right now isn't willing to pay more, because it's tougher, for example, if you have you know, power, and I'm sure you're gonna talk about uh, power, you know, sometimes it's available, sometimes it's not. There's a lot of work to build out this new EV infrastructure to be just as flexible, just as convenient, and as cheap as what consumers are used to today. And that cost has to be borne out someplace. So either it's got to be borne out by governments, it's got to be borne out by tax subsidies, or it's got to be borne out by companies who are increasingly under cost pressure uh, because, not just because it's the right thing to do, because that only goes so far, but because it's actually good business to make this, invest, this forward investment. Uh, and you know, sometimes for companies especially, it's easier to look at the next quarter versus looking at the next decade. Uh, and we're trying to encourage companies to look forward, governments to look forward, and to keep at it because we're going through this difficult transition phase right now. Great, thanks so much, Dara. Jane Burston, Chief Executive of the Clean Air Fund. Could I bring you in uh, next? Tell, tell us a little bit about the Clean Air Fund for those people in the audience who don't know the great work you do, but then um, maybe go on from the points Dara is making. Have you sensed this momentum shift? And, and if you have, what could be some of the solutions? Uh, so thank you. The, the Clean Air Fund is a philanthropic foundation. Um, we work with businesses, governments and not-for-profits on projects that reduce air pollution. Um, and we try and create the circumstances in which there is political will to put in place the conditions that makes the right choices the cheaper and easier ones. Because I completely agree, people will um, have an appetite for uh, greener and cleaner policy, but they might not be willing to pay for it. And kind of why should they, frankly? Um, so the sorts of things that we do are about creating these conditions that for an ambitious mayor or an ambitious government, they can step into and implement uh, a policy, maybe a low emission zone, the right kind of taxes or subsidies to incentivize electric vehicles. Or if the government is uh, not ambitious, maybe we create the conditions to make them more ambitious. Um, a lot of what uh, motivates people to care about uh, electric vehicles and air pollution is the environmental cost of pollution, but it's actually mostly the health cost. Um, there's uh, some ridiculously large statistics on the number of deaths per year from air pollution. It's 8 million people a year, which is a huge percentage of the deaths annually globally. And uh, it's particularly bad for children because uh, even when they're in the womb, it causes about a third of miscarriages air pollution does in uh, Southeast Asia. And babies that are born in areas with higher pollution have a lower birth weight and that affects them for the rest of their lives. And once they're born, obviously pollution often sits kind of lower to the ground because it's heavy and that's where children are out playing, they're in a pushchair. So um, people really care about the health of their kids, whether or not it's safe for their kids to go outside, uh, whether their kids can get an education, because in some parts of the world, the traffic pollution is so bad that kids can't concentrate at school uh, because the pollution is poisoning them. And that's really highly motivational and people can connect with those stories. So I don't know whether any of you have heard of uh, Ella Kissy Debra. Anybody? Nobody? Yes. Okay. One, Great two, house. there's a little, very, very tragic story of a little girl uh, aged nine in London who died of a severe asthma attack brought on by traffic pollution. And she's the first person in the world to have air pollution written as the cause of death on her death certificate because of the hard work of her mum getting the inquest reopened after she found out that they live on the South Circular, which is the inner ring road in London, super congested, uh, loads of heavy trucks use it, and her school was also just off that road. And because it's a big road, there's an air pollution monitor right there by their house. And so the chief pediatrician in the UK uh, correlated the times that Ella went to hospital in the last few years of her life, all of the really severe asthma attacks that she had with peak pol pollution episodes on that road. 
and her mum now is a huge advocate for reducing pollution in London and the rest of the UK and globally. And people see her and think, that could be me. You know, it's not these statistics of the 8 million deaths. It's not something that I can think, you know, I can't imagine dying anyway. We have this cognitive dissonance about death statistics. And we tend to think that that's happening in parts of the world that we don't live in. But when you see uh, Rosamond talking about how she's worried about her twins now because they also have severe asthma, um, you can really connect with that story. And that is what has provided the momentum in London for the low emission zone, which has not been without political difficulty in this latest expansion to 10 million people. It's been uh, quite a bun fight. Um, but it's why the zone got introduced. It's why there was no um, backlash against the first two phases of the zone because of Rosamond, because of doctors who are very trusted, talking about the health impacts of, on, on people in London and especially on children. And Jane, sorry, uh, that's excellent. It's, it's interesting. Maybe I'll come back to you, Dara, in a sec. But that notion of obviously climate is everything, but health is maybe a better connection point for people about why things need to change now rather than in the next um, uh, decade. Should they make, should Uber and others be making much more of that part of the EV conversation that maybe isn't heard as much? It is still really seen as a macro climate change issue rather than a pollution issue. That appears to be what you're Yeah, saying. Yeah, I think so, because especially at a local level, because loads of these, uh, you know, Dara said we need the incentives uh, to be set up better. And loads of the incentives end up being set up at a local level. Mm. And it's quite easy for people to think, yes, it's great for climate change, but like, why am I doing something when the, uh, you know, the largest carbon dioxide emissions are elsewhere? What's China doing? What's the US doing? But actually, you know, the 6,000 uh, childhood asthma cases in London, I know some kids with asthma. That's, that's a local yeah. problem. That's something that I can get behind. Do you think the momentum has shifted? In terms of the, the, the conversation, certainly in the UK, where you know you and I are based, um, the conversation has shifted. That, that there needs this needs to be slower, pushing out you know um, uh, the ending of combustion, sale of combustion um, uh, cars um, to 2035 to yeah. match with the EU. Has there been this change? Do you feel? Uh, yeah, I think at, and a why? at a national level in the countries that we operate in, yes. At a city level, I don't think so at all. I think the city mayors are actually pushing forward much more quickly on air pollution grounds than they have, and also climate grounds than they ever have before. Um, it's unfortunate that at a national level in, in the UK and formerly in um, Poland, where we do a lot of work, there has been a reluctance to move quickly. And I, I, you know, I'm totally baffled by this rollback of the. There was a. Um, an earlier date for the phase out of combustion engine, new, the sale of new combustion engine vehicles in the UK that the Prime Minister moved back when nobody was asking for that. Uh, so um, I think people think it's bonkers. The market actually is going to move us in that direction. Anyway. Bonkers is silly for people who don't have <laughs> the UK. <laughs> um, but th there, are, there are things that city mayors cannot do by themselves. You know, I think licensing is one of the things that the mayors we work with talk about a lot because in the UK for example if a taxi is licensed in Birmingham it can operate in London so despite uh, London wanting to license taxis that are greener they can't control taxis coming in from elsewhere other than through things like a low emission zone which is politically very risky to do they have gone ahead and done it yeah. excellent well we'll come on to localism later I know Lisa for example is, is very engaged in that area Greg Jackson, um, founder, CEO, Octopus Energy. I think for the room, I think explain Octopus Energy's journey, which is fascinating. But of course, a lot of the EV debate is around infrastructure and doability. Can we do what we need to do? So, Greg, we'd love to hear, tell us about Octopus Energy and then tell us about EV leasing, EV charging and what your sense is on Dara's point about momentum. Yeah, so um, first of all, about Octopus Energy, uh, forgive me for what may sound like a pitch, but <laughs> that, um, uh, particularly for, for uh, people from the States and so on, um, you'll be less familiar, but uh, we're an eight-year-old startup. Our revenue is nearly $20 billion a year, um, and uh, we provide uh, clean energy to millions of households across uh, the UK, but also most European countries, very big in Japan. And the insight behind it really is that fundamentally, uh, renewable energy is the cheapest energy we've ever had, and it's getting cheaper every year. 
Um, and uh, what we have is an outdated system that means consumers don't see the benefit. In fact, one of the things that causes backlash and misunderstanding is that the system we've inherited built around fossil fuels on everything from household energy to industrial to transport has somehow managed to make green energy a premium product. Mm. We literally tax people for doing the right thing, even though the underlying physics are that it's the cheapest way of powering our lives. And our job is solving that. Um, and by the way, it works. Uh, energy companies globally, I mean, or utilities, whatever you want to call them, um, are either invisible or unpopular. We've got a 44-point net promoter score advantage over the next best company in the sector. It's the greatest gap of any company in any sector in the UK. Um, and we're now the biggest power provider in the UK because it works. And uh, look, the kind of thing that we've tried to do is to say to consumers that when it's windy and sunny, the more power you use, the cheaper it gets, and it keeps getting cheaper. You don't necessarily have to think about it. The very, very best uh, corollary with this, or best complement for this, is electric vehicles. A household with an electric vehicle uses twice as much electricity as one without. And all of that additional consumption can be shifted. You get home and you plug in. You don't care whether we charge your car at 6 a.m., 6 p.m. In fact, for most people, you don't care whether it's Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, as long as you've got the miles when you need them. So you're using uh, huge amounts of, um, forgive me, obviously everyone has here to talk about AI, but you use huge amounts of AI. We kind of estimate when every car is going to get home, how much battery it'll need, and we match that. It's the cheapest energy available, which really correlates with clean energy. Just to give an idea about how impactful this is, uh, I'll use UK numbers because it's our biggest market, but um, we, uh, a customer using our smartest product to charge a car, pays £2.30 for every 100 miles. For an internal combustion engine car, it's 20 pounds. Uh, petrol and diesel cost eight times more than green power if we're using the tech correctly. Um, now, uh, what we're finding, first of all, let's talk about this backlash thing. And forgive me for this, for another Britishism, but I, honestly, I couldn't think of any other way of expressing it. The fossil fuel industry are shitting themselves, right? <laughs> um, and I'm lucky enough to spend a lot of time with them as a power company, and, and we, we even sell an awful lot of gas. Um, I spent a lot of time with them, and they've woken up to the fact that electric vehicles are insanely popular, and the exponential demand for electric vehicles has caused this, this backlash. Every article you read can be traced back to a fossil fuel lobbyist, right? If you speak to people who drive electric cars, speak to the Uber passengers that go in the back of them. It is a superior experience. It's dramatically cheaper to run. By the way, I, I don't know about that. Everyone's got an electric car, right? I mean, I've had them seven years. The total amount of spent on servicing is $160, all right? Total amount ever. So you've got an entire industry now quaking when it realizes that not only policy, not only uh, the desire for governments from net zero, not only the commitments that are made and the brilliant work from city mayors, but consumers prefer the product. Now, today, some people may say, look, electric cars are a rich person's plaything. But if we look at the tidal wave of cheap models that are going to be emerging from China soon, and look, of course, you've got all the trade challenges and things like that, but they reveal the underlying economics of EVs are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Look, battery costs fell 13% last year. They fell 13% the year before. Over the last 30 years, they've fallen 97%. So we've got the hardware is coming down massively in price uh, through technology. It's coming down massively in price through scale. And the cost to fuel them is getting cheaper every year. The more wind farms and solar farms we build, the cheaper the power at the best times. Um, and for the fossil fuel industry, it's particularly bad news. Because the moment a household gets an electric car and realizes that by uh, using clean energy, they can reduce their cost of travel 8x, they ask, like, what else can I do? We found the electric car is the gateway drug for the transition. Um, the moment you get an electric car, you start thinking, well, what if I got a heat pump and got rid of my gas boiler and my gas furnace? Right? What if I got solar panels? By the way, solar panels reduce the cost of your heat pump and your EV by another 80%. Now, of course, not everyone can have all these solutions today. Many people, for example, might not live in a house where they've got the ability to have a cheap charger at home and solar panels on the roof. And a... But as we build out the infrastructure for people, for the early adopters, it makes it cheaper for everyone else. We'll hear about the public charging infrastructure isn't yet up to speed, right? Uh, but it's growing exponentially. 
And uh, as we learn how that infrastructure is used, the data behind it, are able to put more of the right charges in the right places. And as the costs keep coming down, so we open up wave after wave of accessibility, of access to EVs for everyone. And so I think, look, this backlash is not, it is a manufactured resistance. But politicians are responding. Uh, look, politicians, Voters appear to be responding. Politicians will respond up to the point they discover that people actually prefer these products. Right? And we see it with every technology wave. Uh, look, I, I, who remembers the first generation of the mobile internet? Do you remember WAP? I mean, probably most people are too young. <laughs> right? Anyone looked at WAP and said, the mobile internet is never going to happen. <laughs> right? Two or three years later, you had the technology revolution of the smartphone with a touchscreen, and it changed the world. Right? We can't, and I, I said to a fossil fuel executive, he said, look, you know, we need an orderly transition. We're take. I said, it's too late, mate. You know, look, um, when consumers realize when the people who can do it are putting solar panels up and charging their cars, and they've disconnected themselves from your world, and their neighbors are discovering it, and it's scaling this stuff, it's all going to happen. They can slow it down through, their, uh, th through this kind of backlash dialogue, but it's the job of leaders. And look, everywhere I look at WEF, there are these things about, apparently it's about leadership to make the world a better place. Everyone in this room, everyone in every room, other than the fossil fuel lobbyists, should be spreading this story, because look, it is going to happen. It's our job to make it happen as fast as we can, not only because it's good for the planet, but because actually it's incredible. Like, the, the local air pollution story is so untold. Um, mm. You know Shenzhen has now got cleaner air than London, right? Um, just to say, because yeah, yeah. they're doing this. And so um, as we, if, if we're really here to lead and we look at the fundamentals, we know it's better for consumers. And it's also the greatest business opportunity of my lifetime. Energy today is a $2 trillion sector, right? The entire automotive sector over the next 15 years will change. And companies that lead will deliver greater value for their shareholders than those that are trying to resist inevitable change. Excellent, Greg. Greg, can I just ask you, fossil fuel in industry you've got in your sites or should be in our sites. What about the car makers themselves, the truck makers? Have they also got vested interests in slowing down progress, or do you feel that they actually want to get on? I mean, look, I'm not making many friends, am I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know who's look, in the audience, but um, I hope you're enjoying this. <laughs> look, uh, look, first of all, I can say wishful thinking is the greatest enemy of shareholder value, right? Like, if, if, you, if your assets are 100 years of knowledge in heavy drivetrains and the gearboxes, of course, you know, you, kind of, you don't want to lose that phenomenal competitive advantage and all the brilliant engineers you employ understand it better than anyone else in the world and it really would be convenient if this change wasn't going to come but this change is going to come and <laughs> those that accept it and learn how to make the most of the change how to capitalize on it to create better products and services will create a better long-term shareholder value than those that resist change and we've seen this in industry after industry that gets disrupted by technology. Uh, very briefly, I, I, I come from a software background. We built enterprise software. In 2006, I was over the moon when, when we won Borders Books as a client. They came to us because they'd been tied up since 1997 in an exclusive deal with Amazon because they had wished that the internet wasn't going to be that serious. By 2006, they could finally start to think about having their own online presence. And by 2007, they were dead. Because traditionally, what incumbents think is they can watch a trend, and when it gets big, they'll acquire their way into it. But by then, the companies that have set the trend have created exponential value, and you can never catch up. And so the advice to the automakers is, look, of course, for 10 or 15 years, there's going to be some demand for the products they currently make. But all of our R&D efforts should be focused on looking at the fundamentals of where the world's going, not driven by policy, but driven by the innovation and invention that we're seeing around electrification. Yeah. I think part, part of the issue with the automakers is that the early adopters of any technology are the premium consumers, right? So it's the consumer who's willing to pay 70, 80,000 for a Tesla, right? Uh, and I think that the first generation, first one and a half generation of models that automakers, especially US and European automakers have built are designed for the luxury customer, the you know, EBMW or the trucks that you know, the US is completely addicted to. Um, that generation of cars, and you know, it's a big capital business, et cetera, and they build these plants for eight, 10 years, that generation is not going to uh, make a big dent on the environment. That's not what we need. So we need affordable cars 
for the everyday. You know, when, when it comes to our drivers and we talk to them about buying an EV, yes, it's nice that they can help the environment, et cetera, but what's in it for me? How much is it gonna cost me? What's the cost per mile? What are the repair costs that I can associate? I can't have a, uh, a charger in my home because I don't have a garage. Mm -hmm. So when do I charge, et cetera? All of these issues come to the fore and you have to build, and it's not a single product. Like It's not just a car, it's also uh, financing, it's insurance, it's recharge, it's their time, you know, when can they charge, et cetera. You really have to build a whole environment for them to make the jump. When they make the jump and when we can bring everything together, our drivers who have made the switch to EVs absolutely love it. But it can't be a demand on them to do the right thing. You know, they're coming to us and say, what's in it for me? And a third of our drivers can't afford cars. Usually they buy secondhand cars. There isn't really a secondhand market for EVs, et cetera. But the biggest message that we have in talking to OEMs is we need an affordable car, EV. We need an EV that's $15,000, $16,000 instead of EVs that are $40,000, $50,000. Once we get there, and you know, I think the Chinese manufacturers are going to be, it's going to be a huge sea change in the U.S., not so much. Hopefully in other parts of the world, uh, the Chinese manufacturers or some of the Asian manufacturers can affect that change in order for the mass market switch to happen. And Lisa, just before I bring you in, Lisa, um, Dara, could I just ask you about the pollution issue? Is mm -hmm. that a better connector for making the argument than the macro climate issue? So I, I think that there are two different conversations. The, the policy conversations can center around climate change, pollution, et cetera. And I think we've got to stop making the consumer feel like we're talking down to them. Uh, like we're preaching to them, et cetera. So I think some of these personal stories what you talked about are incredibly important because then that hits on a very human level mm -hmm. as to why I should support this change, not some theoretical, you know, if you don't do it, you're a bad person, right? Tell me why it's going to help my neighbor. Tell me why it's going to help me. So I think that's one level of conversation. When it hits the consumer, just the product has to be better. And, and if the cheap. product is better, you know, yeah, better, yeah. cheaper, faster, you know, last longer, et cetera. So when it hits our consumers, when they get that uh, Tesla on Uber, they love it just because it's better. And then they tip more to the driver. We're paying the driver more. They're getting more tips. It's an affordable car. Uh, it runs forever. It doesn't break down. So when it gets to the consumer, the product just has to be better. We can't talk, kind of talk down to them on don't you have to do the right thing? Because, you know, they have to go to dinner and pay for dinner that night. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Dyer. Lisa Rock Alexander, you're the Chief Sustainability Officer at Sempra. Mm -hmm. Do tell um, the audience here um, a little bit about what Sempra does. I think that'd be useful. But, Lisa, I think we were talking just before we sat down around this idea of, lo well, not quite localism. These are big cities and big city solutions. But that the local drive, Jane, you were saying that the mayors are still driving for, for change, even though in some other areas, momentum has shifted. So tell us a bit about Sempra and tell us a bit about the local successes that Sempra is deeply involved in. Sure, so Sempra is an energy infrastructure company. We serve more Americans, their daily heat and electricity, every day through our infrastructure than any other single uh, company. So about 15% of the American population is served by our operating companies, which includes some of the country's largest utilities. Those utilities are primarily in some of the biggest markets in the country, California, Texas. We also have significant assets in Mexico. So if you combine those, our infrastructure is really powering uh, the third largest GDP if you add those markets together. Um, we also have the highest percent of renewables flowing through our grids compared to any other single utility infrastructure company in the country. So in Texas, in California, we're well over 60% renewables at any point in time, and often that can go higher. So we have this incredible footprint to make a difference. We're powering some of the world's most significant economies, some of the fastest growing economies, and it's a real opportunity to tap into growth related to reducing emissions and improving air pollution. So if I double click into San Diego, which, uh, where we have significant infrastructure, um, we have some of the highest penetration of rooftop solar 
in that area. We have some of the highest penetration of electric vehicles compared to any other uh, city in the country there. Almost 100,000 electric vehicles in San Diego alone. We have about 10,000 chargers today. Um, in terms of the, some of the conversations been about the blocks, we've actually had a 40% year-over-year growth in electric vehicles in that market. So we think about what's possible. San Diego is a really great example for what can happen with the future. Um, and today it sounds like a lot already, but by 2030, we expect to grow from around 100,000 electric vehicles to nearly a million, from 10,000 chargers to nearly 200,000 chargers in just six years, right? So this is an incredible business opportunity for chargers, for the electric vehicle companies, and for others. From my perspective, we think about operating the grid to keep the electricity on and to power this. So uh, Greg had mentioned that one electric vehicle in terms of energy demand is roughly the equivalent of um, half a residential home. So if you do the math, essentially by 2030, San Diego currently has a housing stock of around 500,000 homes. By 2030, we will have the equivalent in EVs of another 500,000 homes in our city served by the grid. It is a doubling of, of the load that we typically have. So as we think about what's possible on a local level, uh, we really think about how we shore up the grid to make that happen. But most excitingly is the role of EVs in energy. So we're talking here about transforming uh, the transportation sector. You see drivers and cars. Um, I see roaming virtual energy grids through the electric vehicle fleets of the future. So we're doing a lot with vehicle to grid, uh, pilots and demonstrations, vehicle to everything. So it's not just vehicle to grid, it's vehicle to home, it's vehicle to uh, generators in the case of a crisis. Um, so we're really excited about the software and hardware prospects, partnering with many, and partnership is key uh, to drive that. Today, where we see the most near opportunity for this vehicle to everything, um, really comes down to a local example with school buses. Fixed routes, charged during the day when we have the most solar coming through the grid, excuse me, through the grid. Um, and there we're able to aggregate what the school buses are doing, aggregate the demand, and really use the bus fleets to help balance the energy grid and to help maximize the renewables that are coming online while also making sure we don't run into reliability issues. So from a grid perspective, we think that EVs are truly part of the future. And it's not just about transforming energy. It's about transforming, or about transforming uh, transportation. It's about transforming our energy systems. Lisa, talk us a bit through, I mean, slightly ignorant about many parts of America, sadly, and forgive mm. me. Um, the accessibility issues in Europe, where we have a certain type of city infrastructure yeah. building, many, many apartments, very small streets, lots of it built in the 19th century. <laughs> Britain in particular is, a lot of it is very old and very cramped and very inaccessible for the kind of infrastructure that we're all talking about on this panel. I imagine San Diego doesn't have as many challenges in terms of the accessibility of charges. Is there anything that Europe and the UK could learn from what the work you've been doing, particularly in California, on accessibility? Because Dara's made the point, until the vehicle is cheaper and the charging is more accessible to me, and I live in a fifth floor apartment in a poorer part of London, how do we fix that? Right. So, you know, California is a hotbed of innovation. Largely, it's because so much of our infrastructure is new. We have a lot of land, so we don't deal with these generational uh, built environment issues. Um, I will speak to an important part of what you just said, though, um, and that goes back to the affluence that's been driving EV adoption to date. Um, charging is also related largely to single family homes as well as public charging stations. The real gap in California and probably in London as well relates to rental environments and to apartments. So more than 40% of people in, in our state in California live in those environments. 
And there are a number of issues. Part of it is the physical space, and you alluded to that, which, which is a challenge in London as well. I think that the bigger issue is the economic disconnect between the owners of the apartments and then the renters. So the renters who would be charging benefit directly from that charging infrastructure, the owner's incentive to put it in place is much less so. And this is where public policy can really come into play to bridge those economic, uh, the economic misalignment. Yeah, that's great, Lisa. Dara, we're coming towards the last five, six, seven minutes of this um, fantastic um, discussion. Just wanted to move it on a little bit into the notion of how we travel. My daughter's 23, my son is 20. I remember wanting to, desperate to buy my first car as soon as I could pass my test. At 17, you could start taking driving lessons. At 18, you could pass your test. And at 18 and one day, you could buy a really bad car and drive around in it. <laughs> In the UK, we've just had figures um, earlier this week. It is now more expensive for an 18-year-old to insure their car mm -hmm. than it is for an 18-year-old to buy a car. Wow. I cannot imagine my daughter and my son, they haven't passed their driving tests. They use Uber via my family app, so I need to obviously consider that <laughs> um, expense to their father, uh, who's a lovely man. Um, but just take us forward five, 10 years, you're in the transportation of people industry as well as many other things. Very much. How does, that, how does it change and how does that help this debate? My son and my daughter would much rather travel around in a nice EV. How does personal transport change if people aren't actually buying their own cars? Well, I actually think it's a, it, it, it's a quite a positive trend if people are uh, more attached to services versus assets. Right, if you think about a car, a, a car is an unbelievably in, inefficient uh, piece of equipment, right? 95% of the time it, it lays fallow, 5% of the time it's, it's used. And so one of the goals that we have as a company is to intrude uh, transportation as a service and to be available for every single use case that you might want to use, which is it might want to be, you might want a car to go from point A to B, but you want, might want a car for a weekend, or you might want to go get groceries, have it for a couple of hours, et cetera. So we are actually actively increasing the number of different occasions and services that we have for Uber, so that we move from being that point A to B type of service to one that can service every single occasion in your life uh, as to wanting a car. Because if we have less cars on the road, if you have more shared ownership, of these incredibly valuable but expensive assets to the world, right? The, the carbon footprint and the environmental footprint and cost of each of these cars is significant to the extent that you can have, instead of one-to-one -one car ownership, uh, one-to-many car ownership, uh, and, and that comes with on-demand, it comes with uh, sharing of Ubers, having more than one person in an Uber. We're developing now high-capacity vehicles in developing markets and Egypt and India, et cetera, where we have essentially Ubers with 20 or 30 people in that single vehicle, we think we can radically reduce the environmental cost of, of these vehicles. Listen, my kid is 20 years old. He hasn't taken his driver's test. It drives me effing crazy. Uh, but there's a lot of colloquialism you know, on the stage yeah. here, quite, some quite aggressive language. I'm liking this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, you, um, I'm sorry about the effing. Uh, but, it's, uh, but in terms of environmental uh, footprint, we think that's a, that's a terrific trend that we hope to continue. Yeah. Greg, can I pick up on a very powerful point that Lisa made about this accessibility issue? Renting spaces, spaces which are, just don't have the economic muscle, maybe. You said it's been odd that we're in a world where this is seen as a premium product, even though the base energy coming in is cheaper. What we've, you've asked Dara for policy proposals. Who needs to change so that the landlords have a duty to put it as part of the rental agreement? I don't know. What, what Greg can change it? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, kind of picking up on, on what Dara's analogies earlier, uh, this thing about the expense of electric vehicles today, the hardware, the capital cost. Uh, <coughs> when the iPhone was launched, Steve Ballmer, the then CEO of Microsoft, laughed loud on TV. Mm. He said, who's going to pay $500 for a phone? And it hasn't even got any buttons, right? And there were two failures <laughs> of, of vision in that statement. One was that buttons were going to be necessary, right? And, and I think understanding the, 
for example, a lot of things you lose when you get an uh, electric car, you lose the noise, right? Mm -hmm. you, cannot, you can't rev one. What a massive upgrade for the citizenry, and indeed, actually, for drivers, right? Um, but the other failure was the failure of vision that understood that what started at $500, and by the way, still an iPhone, if you want to spend a lot of money, they've got much more expensive ones available, but would also pave the way to you know, the $10, $20 Android within half a decade that changed the world. And we have the same underlying uh, processes now that mean that there will always be very premium electric cars, just like there are very premium petrol cars. But the base models are going to get cheaper. The cheapest model is basically a skateboard with a battery and some open source software, right? And that is, that is what we're building. Um, and that's why, whether it be from China or you know, even in the, sort of, you know, the US, sooner or later, um, consumer demand will say, look, we see these devices elsewhere and we want them. And the first thing we have to do is remember, again, those of us old enough, when the iPhone launched, you couldn't get a signal, right? First of all, it launched with Edge. As the uh, certainly in Europe, as the as the wireless signal. Now, if you've got an e, if you've got an e on your phone now, you, you bloody write a letter, <laughs> right? It's faster. You can transfer more, more data faster. But it paved the way. The second thing was you couldn't get a signal for many months in most cities because suddenly the data infrastructure, which had not, never been built for it, was swamped. Consumer demand drove the change that meant you ended up with you know near universal 3G, 4G, 5G. Consumer demand will drive it. Mm. Essentially, the more we can put electric cars on the road, the more that the, um, the people who get them will be demanding of their local authorities uh, the ability to, for example, uh, run a cable across the pavement with the right um, protection, or to have a channel across the pavement so they do it at home, or uh, to have lamppost charging on every lamppost, right? or to have charging stations. So the first thing is we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that consumer demand, which is consumers are voters and citizens, can really drive change. But in the regulatory side, I mean, we have this crazy thing at the moment where there are literally cities in the UK where the council, uh, that's the local authority, um, tell you how to run a, a cable across a pavement and show you how to do it safely. And there's others where they prosecute you for it. So what we have to now be mm. doing is illustrating to policymakers that thanks to innovation for the private sector and early policy, there is now phenomenal demand we need to make it easy. So whether it be, you know, forcing landlords to put communal charging in buildings, which, by the way, works brilliantly for driving adoption, or for those cities where people park on streets, finding solutions to that. Yeah, OK. Um, Jane, policy solutions, this is what we've been looking for, things that are, are doable. I love, Greg, the consumer demand side of this, but we know there is still a digital divide. Many, many people don't have access to the smartphone ecology. Sorry, come on, I mean, that's... In the UK, 97% uh, of people have got a smartphone or an internet connection directly themselves at home. Just to say, but don't carry the same kit around with them, do they? If, if, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, it's really interesting. By the way, I'm so sorry to have this to be yeah, no, no, okay, yeah. separate. Yeah. The point really being, look, it's not totally universal, yeah. and it's not totally universal globally, but it's pretty universal. Right, OK. Yeah. So you can get there through consumer demand. OK. Jane, policy solutions to this notion that Lisa raised around, particularly in Europe, where the infrastructure, the heritage infrastructure, is so difficult in terms of maybe putting in new infrastructure? Uh, well, I was just thinking as you were talking, timing is critical. So I actually worked on London's first electric vehicle strategy 15 years ago, and I had forgotten about that until this conversation. <laughs> And I remember we got some modeling of who the early adopters were, and it was exactly as Dara has said. It's like uh, people who think of themselves as green, who are able to afford the Tesla, who actually in London don't have a driveway or a garage because they live in Richmond and Camden, uh, and these central London boroughs. And then what's the, what's the adoption curve? And so uh, timing for uh, the charging infrastructure has to be right, because in London, if you know Croydon, that's where people, that was like, at the time, the most perfect area for the adoption of electric vehicles. People who were likely to adopt them were only driving three or four miles a day, dropping their kids off at school. These other people in the outskirts of London were driving maybe 50 miles a day. They did have a driveway and a garage. They were not early adopters. You know, they're, they're on the way, like, going to adopt electric vehicles on the way down. So I think one of the issues is timing, because obviously, as the government, you don't want to invest in a load of infrastructure that won't be used, especially when, had they have done that in London, there'd have been a backlash. Why are you stealing these car parking? 
parking spaces for electric vehicles when nobody has one and nobody wants one. So uh, another example from Poland, having said that national governments weren't behind this, uh, I take it back for Poland for electric vehicles because actually the national government moved too fast and their first law uh, to enable cities to put in place um, low emission zones said that they had to only allow electric vehicles. So Krakow implemented one, electric vehicle penetration was like 0.1 of a percent. Nobody could drive there they had to cancel it and it set back mm. electric vehicle adoption and low emission zones in Poland by a number of years. Now the law's changed and uh, it's more about cleaner vehicles. Um, but yeah, I think timing is one point. And the other is uh, focusing on this point that Dara mentioned at the beginning about mileage driven, not number of vehicles. Um, so uh, I think corporate fleets, taxis, really making sure that the incentives are there for those who are driving the most miles to come off of their combustion engine vehicle um, are not focusing so hard on alternatives to a uh, private car, uh, like EVs as an alternative to a combustion engine vehicle for private car drivers, I think is a critical one. Yeah. Dara, we've come to the end of our um, time together, but just to finish with you, just the three takeaways for the audience and also I'm seeing a huge number of people here whilst I'm here, some of them policymakers. So I will reflect on this conversation <laughs> to them in uh, the number of meetings I'm going to be having. But three things that should happen this year or in the medium term, which will really help your drive towards being, is it in the end, are an EV only business? That's what you want Uber to be, isn't it? Of course. Uh, I think, listen, ultimately it's going to go there. The three things I'd say are affordability, affordability, affordability. <laughs> Make Very it affordable to the mass market. Easy. Dara, thank you so much. Lisa, thank you. Jane and Greg, even though you swore on stage, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, audience. What a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Et les aides à se relever. 
Most dislike being alone. No. Tell the ones who know me I like it that way too. This like being alone in a society. Knowing that there is some company if I need to talk. I haven't touched yet. Is there a good reason for a lovely creeper bed? Feels like being stoned in a society. Not that there is nothing worth to know about. Captured knowledge and camera unsteady. I admit that every point I'm trying to make loses weight. As soon as you've been told. Lots of philosophy. Soon as you've been told the key, lots of philosophy. It's getting dark, but my the lamp broke. Maybe right, maybe wrong, though. I need experience. Feels like. 